Hey everyone, welcome to the fourth session in Jude, and I hope that you are ready for some more meat. Maybe you think after the last session we were going to take a break and go light, but we're not. So let's get started. We're going to dig in. It's going to be super. If you don't like meat, it's not going to be good for you. You're not going to like it, but I love it. So um, I'm probably going to start talking fast because I'm excited, so I'll try to I'll try to slow down a little bit. But let's begin just right in Jude chapter 1, uh, verse 8. In the very same way... On the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. So let's look at this first line where he talks about these dreamers. Uh, this, this prophet or dreamer quotation at the beginning is actually referencing Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. So we're going to look at that real quick. If you turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, it says, If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder spoken of takes place, and the prophet says, Let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him, serve him, and hold fast to him. That prophet or dreamer must be put to death, for inciting rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. That prophet or dreamer tried to turn you from the way the Lord your God commanded you to follow. You must purge the evil from among you. So God tells the people what should be done with these false prophets or dreamers who lead his people astray. Then Jude goes into what these false prophets, what their teachings are causing. And it's what we know already. It, defiling the flesh through sexual immorality. If you remember, the Gnostics believed that flesh was matter and that it was inherently evil. There was nothing to be done about it, but matter couldn't touch spirit, so their spirit was still good, so it didn't matter what the flesh did. They also pushed how grace could cover it all, so like they're just giving grace an opportunity to work. Another thing Jude points out they're guilty of is rejecting the authority of the church, which is really rejecting the authority of God. But they also spoke evil of angels, God's messengers. And I assume this means they had a lack of respect for the spiritual. Every Christian must be aware of the spiritual battle that we are engaging in and shouldn't make light of the enemy in his wiles. This is one thing that I see happening a lot right now. The greatest trick the enemy has ever pulled off is making us believe he doesn't exist. And in, in thinking that devil doesn't exist and that he's not trying, in thinking hell doesn't exist, like it makes light of the enemy and we're not worried about it and we're not engaged in spiritual battle. This is what's happening here in this time and it's happening in our time. As an example of them speaking ill of the evil messengers, he brings up a story from another Jewish text, The Assumption of Moses. This is one of those texts that's not in the Bible um, that caused some controversy as to whether or not to include Jude in the Bible. Uh, but we're, we're not going to look at it, but we're going to talk about what it says. And it actually elaborates on the story in Deuteronomy 34, verses 4 through 6. So if you'll turn with me there, let's read that. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land I promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab, in the valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day no one knows where his grave is. So in this story, the archangel is given the job of burying Moses. And while he's burying Moses, Satan comes to claim the body of Moses based on two things. One, the body was matter, and matter was evil. It wasn't spirit, so it belonged to the devil. He laid claim to it. Another claim he made on Moses' body was that Moses had committed murder when he killed the, the Egyptian. And so he said, a murderer belongs to me. This actually reminds me, if you've ever read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there's a scene where the White Witch comes and lays claim to Edmund because he's a traitor. And Aslan, as a representative of Jesus, takes the place of Edmund. But this is the same thing. Satan comes to wrestle with the angel over the body of Moses. But Michael, being an archangel, rebukes the devil only by saying, The Lord rebuke you. 
Michael knew where the power and authority to resist the devil came from. It came from God alone. Even Jesus, when he was resisting the devil's temptation in the wilderness, quoted the Bible. He uses the word of God. Judas saying here, if angels don't speak ill of or make light of the devil, neither should man. Everyone reading this letter would have understood this rebuke from Jude because they are all familiar with the assumption of Moses. These men, Jude goes on to say, have no spiritual discernment. They're ruled by their fleshly desires. They're no different than beasts. Make no mistake, one comes from the other. If we don't listen to the voice of God when he speaks, we won't recognize it. So often I've heard people say, man, how could God let this happen to that person? Why would they go do that? And I said, don't you think God was there saying, don't do this, don't do this. And they just didn't listen. It's like, don't do this, don't do this. And the voice just gets softer until we, we tune it out. We become deaf to God. So often I've heard people come to me and they say, I can't hear the voice of God anymore. I don't know how to hear it. And my answer is always, what is the last thing he told you to do? And they always remember because the last thing that he told them to do is, is usually something they haven't done. And I guarantee you, if you go back and you do that thing that God told you to do that you didn't do, you'll begin to hear the voice again, right? And, and Judah is saying, these people have moved so far away from God, they cannot hear his voice. They are deaf to him. They cannot distinguish God from the devil. They cannot distinguish good from evil. So now that we've established that, let's look at verse 11. And in verse 11, he says, Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Now, most of us already know the story of Cain. And just warning you, this is where we're really going to dig in. We are not going to get through all of these examples today um, because they're so interesting and I can make them stretch out into long, lengthy paragraphs of discussion. Um, most of us know the story of Cain, but there are the other two are two less common Bible stories. You're not going to be hearing of Korah's rebellion in a children's church, okay? And there's a good reason for that. But, but even the story of Cain has a deeper meaning than I think most of us are aware of. So we're going to spend some considerable time going through these stories thoroughly. So let's look at the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4, verses 1 through 12. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Then the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And that's why we don't talk about that one in children's church. Um, but this, actually, this story is the first glimpse of the world post-garden. Um, and we can already see the effects of sin passed down through men. And we can see some things going on in Cain's behavior. Uh, like his parents, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they hid from God. There was some shame. Cain, after he kills his brother and God comes, he says, am I my brother's keeper? He doesn't even hide. It's like there's no shame. He's, it's kind of angry. He has this defense, right? And to us, Cain represents the first murderer, right? But for the Jews, he also represents the selfish man, one who opposes the moral world order, one who opposes the authority of God. Even before he murders his brother, we get a glimpse of his attitude toward God in his offering. The author of this passage goes out of his way to describe Abel's offering, right? Fat portions from the firstborn. Cain's offering is described as some fruits of the soil. So let's look at why is God displeased 
by Cain's offering. And so we're going to have to look at some verses to see God's view on tithes and offerings. So if you would, we're going to look at Leviticus 27.30. I know most of us don't pleasure cruise through Leviticus 27.30. and 30. 27.30. Um, so I'm just going to read it real quick. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. This tithe, this tithe uh, is a tenth of everything, and this tenth is repeated throughout the Bible. It's established that a tithe is 10% that you give to God. Abram gives God a tenth in Genesis 14, 19. If you're a church-going person, you may be familiar with the phrase tithes and offerings. And so you may know what an offering is, but I'm going to go over it just in case. Offerings are anything over 10%. It's given in thanks of God's goodness and generosity. Okay, so now that we know what they are, tithes and offerings, we can look at why God may have been displeased with Cain's. Well, it may not have been the 10%. Uh, if you look at Malachi 3.10 real quick, um, and in churches, most this is how it goes. Either your pastor never preaches on tithes, or they preach about it shortly every time before they take a tithe. And if they do, you've probably heard Malachi 3.10 which says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. This is the only thing that God says to test him in. And he's saying here, don't you trust me? Am I not the one who brings the rain and causes the harvest? If you give me a tenth, can I not be trusted to pour out and provide more harvest? Now, we tend to look at that verse because it's very encouraging that God says he'll take care of us and that he'll pour open the floodgates and that we can test him. But if we go back a little bit and read Malachi 3.8, here's a verse you will not hear very often from the pulpit. And this is God talking, just so you know, from the very beginning. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse your whole nation, because you are robbing me. And that's before the verse 10 where he says, test me in this. The, the fact that he says, will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me. Like, And then it says, how are we robbing you? The fact that rob or robbing is repeated so often is to give it emphasis, okay? And God is saying when we don't bring tithes and offerings, we are robbing God. And he says the whole nation was under a curse because they were robbing God. So yes, God can bless us from it, but it's not all like good feelings inside. It's something we give to God, okay? So we can see from that that maybe he wasn't pleased with Cain as he was robbing God. It may, and maybe, let's say it was 10%. Maybe the reason God wasn't pleased with his sacrifice was that it wasn't given willingly. In 2 Corinthians 8, 12, it says, For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. We have to give willingly, with a cheerful heart, not begrudgingly. And God knows. The other thing that might have been the case here is that he didn't give the best. In Leviticus 27, we read verse 30, but if I had continued into verse 32 and 33, we would have seen every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal, and there we see that tenth again, that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. If anyone does make a substitution, both the animal and its substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. Here he says, don't purposefully choose defective livestock as your tithe unto God. Don't give him what you're willing to part with. So often, that's the case. We, we give God what we're willing to part with. I can spare this. He can have this. It's not the first. It's not, it's not the best. Jesus actually used an example of the widow in Mark 14, 21 as an example of a proper tithe. In this example, and it's not a parable, he's sitting there with his disciples watching uh, the people of Israel put their money in the tithes box. And rich men threw in large sums of money. Uh, it was probably not the full 10%. It was probably given begrudgingly, and only so they could be seen doing it. Now, don't think I'm saying that every rich person ties like that, but in this case, I think Jesus knows what they have and how much they're giving, and he knows it's to be seen, and it's not really the 10%. But this widow gives more than 10%. In fact, she gives everything she has to live on. And Jesus says, tie like her. 
because her tithe showed that she feared the Lord, that she loved the Lord, that she obeyed the Lord, and she trusted Him to take care of her. And it was the proper way to give. I've seen this in my life. Um, when we were growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. Um, my mom worked several jobs, and she always tithed. And, but we never, ever went without. Somehow things got provided. It, it always worked out. God took care of us. And it actually showed us through my mom's faithfulness how faithful God is. Even, even when I was angry at God, I couldn't deny his faithfulness because he'd taken care of us because she had been faithful. Now, some pastors shy away from talking about tithe because they fear losing people. People don't want to hear it. I've heard people say, oh, when that, when that bucket comes around, and we act like the pastor or the church is begging for money. But this is actually God, and it's his due, right? And re- obedience only results in blessing, not necessarily financial blessing, but God will provide. So why would we withhold blessing from people? Why would we not preach this? It's a lot like Revelation. It says, whoever reads Revelation will be blessed, but we don't read it. Why? Because it's scary. But it says, whoever reads this will be blessed. And it's our job as pastors to let the people know what God wants from them so they might be blessed. In the U.S., we Christians, we wonder why the U.S. has gone astray. But the average tithe is 2.5%. It's not 10%. You know what this shows? We don't really fear the Lord. We don't really trust Him to take care of us. We don't really obey Him. Yet we want Him to open the floodgates of heaven. We want revival. In Deuteronomy 14, 28, it speaks of a tithe that happens every year, every three years in Israel to care for the widows, to care for the fatherless and those in lower socioeconomic classes. It was the duty of God's people to care for those in need. And that's what some of these tithes went for. And God says throughout the Bible that our generosity will be rewarded. I've actually included in your workbook a ton of scriptures you can look up to back this up. But to be honest, we store up riches for ourselves. We speak of all the wrong in the world, but we don't use our money, the universal language that everyone understands, to put an end to it. The world pours millions of dollars into pornography and sex trafficking. There are people without drinking water, and we may think it's awful, and we may pray, and we may want it to stop, but not enough to spend our money on it. Not enough to part with our money. Is money our God? Is money more important than God? If you have no church, tithe to something God would be pleased with. Or there are organizations that want to end sex trafficking like A21 or Exodus Road. There are so many organizations trying to do good. We don't want to have the same spirit as Cain. And this is what Jude is referring to. And I think that we have gone the way of Cain. I I think Cain didn't fear God. He didn't obey God. Cain loved himself. And in the end, sin got the best of him. And, and, And God even warned him. God even warned him. He said, sin is crouching at your door. It is waiting. And, and, and honestly, sin is crouching at our door as, as individuals and as a country. Who is our God? God, Yahweh, or money? Now that was heavy. <laughs> but are you ready for the next example? Now you see why we're not going to get through all three today. Let's skip ahead to Korah. We're going to touch on Balaam um, because his story is the longest and it's the most interesting to me. Um, So we're going to look at Korah and we'll go into Balaam in the next session. Uh, So if you'll turn with me to Numbers 16, 1 through 11, we'll begin that study. Korah, son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and certain Reubenites, Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, became insolent and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. They came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far. The whole community is holy, and every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? When Moses heard this, he fell face down. Then he said to Korah and all his followers, "In In the morning the Lord will show who belongs to him and who is holy and he will have that person come near him. The man he chooses, he will cause to come near him. You, Korah, and all your followers are to do this. Take censers, and tomorrow put burning coals and incense in them before the Lord. 
The man the Lord chooses will be the one who is holy. You Levites have gone too far. Moses also said to Korah, Now listen, you Levites. Isn't it enough for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the Israelite community and brought you near himself to do the work at the Lord's tabernacle and to stand before the community and minister to them? He has brought you and all your fellow Levites near himself, but now you are trying to get the priesthood too. It is against the Lord that you and all your followers have banded together. Who is Aaron that you should grumble against him? So here we see some of the Levites who have been given the task of working at the tabernacle. They're rebelling against the priesthood of Aaron. They're saying, hey, we are all holy. We're all the same. Why do you get to choose? Why do you get to decide? Why do you get to have power over us? They're unhappy with the place they had been given by the Lord. They thought they should all be priests and have the same authority. Um, But in their hearts, this is self-seeking. If we look at the Psalms, in Psalms 42 through 48, as well as 84 through 87 and 88, if you look underneath the title, the heading, you can see that these were all written by the sons of Korah. So it's possible they were given duties that were restricted to the music in the sanctuary. They were given the lowly, lowly task of worship leader. If only they could wait till this generation, they could finally see the rewards of being a worship leader. And they would see Aaron be like, hey, wait, I want to be a worship leader now. Uh, So let's talk about this story real quick. And I want to make a note. Moses was a man of God. Okay, some pastors or priests have used their powerful positions to manipulate people into sin. If a Christian leader wants you to sin or use their power to get you to sin, and they're acting like they are a representative of God, believe me, they are not a representative of God. Real leaders, real men of God, do not try to get you to sin by their authority given to them by God. Moses is a man of God, and they're not rejecting the thing he's trying to get them to do. He's reject- they're rejecting that they have all the power, and they're the ones talking to God. So Moses says, okay, And he recommends they perform a priestly duty to let the Lord decide who is holy, to let the Lord separate the sheep from the goats. So the whole assembly gathers, uh, because obviously when there are leaders who are upset, they get everyone upset, and everyone starts grumbling and complaining. And so the whole assembly of Israel gathers before God and Moses and Aaron. And God (laughs) tells Moses and Aaron, he says, move away from the assembly, because I'm done with them, and I'm going to smite them. And Moses and Aaron plead for the people and they say, will you punish Will you punish all of the people because of the guilty? And so God tells the assembly, okay, then move away from the guilty parties. Move away from Korah and his followers and his family. And they do. The assembly does move away, which shows that they know Moses has the authority of God because they've seen it enough. And so they obey Moses and they actually move away from Korah and his party and his followers. And let's see what happens. And let's imagine this is Sunday school and let's imagine the faces on the children as we read these verses. And we're going to pick up in verse 28. Then Moses said, This is how you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things and that it was not my idea. If these men die a natural death and suffer the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about something totally new, And the earth opens its mouth and swallows them with everything that belongs to them. And they go down alive into the realm of the dead. Then you will know that these men have treated the Lord with contempt. As soon as he finished saying all this, the ground under them split apart. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their households. And all those associated with Korah together with their possessions. They went down alive into the realm of the dead with everything they owned. The earth closed over them and they perished and were gone from the community. Mm, that's nice. Now, what it says in uh, the King James Version is Sheol, which is another word for hell. So we say the realm of the dead. What it means, they went down alive into hell. Their desire for more honor and power led them to reject the authority of the Lord, and it led to their destruction. In the same way, these men Jude warns against are refusing to listen to the authority of the church. The authority that's been established by God, they're refusing to obey the Bible, the things that we know to be true, the commandments. They thought they knew better. And Jude warns the people, these Gnostics that are murmuring against God, anyone who follows will follow into their own destruction. 
these two examples we've gone over, the Jewish people, like to us, it's just don't go in the way of Cain, don't go the way of Korah. But to them, these are stories that are alive and they're not fables. This isn't like the boy who cried wolf. This is their history. And, and we can learn from our history. There's, there's no point in studying our history if we can't learn from it. They knew their history and Jude is using their history to point out, hey, we know what happens when people disobey the Lord, when they reject his authority, when they follow their own will like Cain, when, when they don't fear God or obey God or love God or trust God, and you are headed that way. Sin is creeping at your door. People, people who say God never spoke to them before they, they did something uh, sin, we just see that he did it with Cain. He came down to Cain and said, don't, don't do this. Don't do this. Sin is creeping at your door. And Jude is giving these warnings, even though these are heavy, heavy warnings, you have to know his heart is saying, don't do this. Sin is creeping at your door. And I say it to you, sin is creeping at your door. Sin is creeping at your door. The spiritual battle I talked about earlier, it's always real. The devil is real. He will attack us, but God has given us power and authority over him. But we have to trust him and we have to obey him. The reason I'm telling you this now, the reason I'm passing on these warnings is so that we can come to know and love and trust God and see the victory by following him and not follow the world into destruction and not follow false teachers into destruction. So I, let's, let's just pray. Lord, I just thank you that you've given us your word as examples, Lord, that we can know which way to go. It's laid out. We can resist false prophets and false teachers and dreamers by looking in your word because you've laid out for us what is right, what is good, what is evil, what is of you, and what is of the devil, Lord. And I just pray for those of us who haven't heard your voice in a while, Lord, that we could go back and do the thing you last told us to do. I just pray for a spiritual discernment for your people, Lord, that we might contend for the faith, not just the Christianity as a whole or in America, but within our hearts, Lord, that we would contend for the faith in our hearts, Lord, that we would allow you to reign in our hearts and in our minds and in our bodies, Lord, that we might be like the widow who trusted you with everything, with all of her livelihood, with all that she had. She put all that she had and she gave it to you because she knew you could be trusted with it. And I know that you can be trusted in all things, Lord. And may your people of this generation trust you like never before. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I pray that that goes with you through the week. I love you, church. We'll see you next time.